Hello and welcome to the Tough Girl podcast, which is all about motivating and inspiring you. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. Today, I've just, you know, I've just forgotten your surname. <laughs> oh, lowest price. Five through the Y, yeah. <laughs> oh, there we go, there we go. Today, I am so excited to bring you our guest. We are going to be speaking with Lois Price. And Lois is a motorcycle rider, a writer, a traveler, and explorer of the world. And she has visited some incredible places on her journey. And she's going to be sharing some of these stories with us. Hi, Lois. How are you? Hi there. I'm fine, thank you. So where are you at the moment? Well, I am actually on, on my boat in London. I live on a, a, a barge uh, in West London, and uh, I'm right here at home at the moment. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> so, love, if I was to get you to introduce yourself and to tell our listeners just a little bit more about you. Yeah, sure thing. Hi, so I'm Lois Price. I'm a British travel writer and motorcycle traveller primarily. I guess it all started back in 2003 when I was working at the BBC. That was my old life with a, an office job, like so many of us. I used to stare out the window wishing that I was doing something more exciting. So um, I guess I was in my late 20s and I decided that that's exactly what I would do. I just passed my motorcycle test and I think it was a combination of boring job plus newly acquired motorcycle licence <laughs> with a, a light bulb moment. So I bought myself a little trail bike like a little 250 dirt bike and I sent it off to Alaska and rode it down to the bottom of South America and that was really sort of how it all began and my first book came out of that trip and so it went on. I have to say there are so many things in that introduction that I want to talk to you about it's just because I know like a lot of um, a lot of my listeners um, it's sometimes it's it's about making that change they may not be happy with what they're doing and so there you are you know you're working for the BBC you're I think you said you're 29 years old you're is stuck in this office job, you're looking out the window and you are dreaming of different things. And a lot of people have these dreams and they want to go traveling and they want to explore and they want to do something different. But very few people actually take that next step and actually turn it into reality. How did you actually go and make that change? Well, it's a very good question and it's a good point that you make because that is actually the hardest part because once you're on the road as I'm sure that you will know from your own adventures once you're out there doing it you just kind of get on with it but to to make the big change in, in your life like that it, it, that's the actual risk really not the bad roads or the you know the dodgy places supposedly the dangerous parts of the world um, so it's kind of giving up on that idea of security so I had a perfectly good job and, and it's sort of job that you know I've thought would you know that I'd hoped to get my whole life at the BBC obviously in the music department I'd worked in the music industry and it was and it, you know it was excellent but it just wasn't for me and so I knew that I had to do something about it and I knew that I would be bitterly miserable if I didn't and not just me you know I was probably no you know it wasn't really good for my you know for the BBC really to have me because <laughs> it was like I didn't want to be there and I think this is the thing you have to listen to your heart and 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 you find your calling that way and actually this is the funny thing that in a way the best thing that came out of me taking that leap giving up my job and I had no idea what I'd do when I came back I didn't know whether I'd, I'd go back into that industry or something new but because of taking that leap and having this motorcycle trip I actually found my calling in life for a career which is writing and I, I'd always enjoyed writing but I never never really considered that I could be an author or a writer as a profession and that came as almost as a byproduct of the trip so it's it's the more the unexpected comes out of these things as well so one thing leads to another and you never really know what what's going to happen and that's what the joy of it is but you do have to take that big jump and you just have to believe that the net is waiting for you and that the world will will take care of you. And I really believe that it does. So you decided to get your motorcycle licence. How did that come about? Well, again, it was a funny thing. I had no idea, <laughs> no idea how it come, really, because I've got no, there's no biking background, you know, in my family or anything. Not like my dad or my brothers don't ride motorbikes. Nobody rides motorbikes. Um, but I always just would see bikes and think, wow, they look fun. And I was always into kind of vintage stuff, um, 50s and 60s, stuff, fashion and music and that kind of stuff. So uh, bikes were a big part of that, you know, all the cool old vintage 
vintage bikes. I thought they look good, you know. Uh, so that's actually the kind of area of motorcycling that I started in with these um, 1950s and 1960s British motorcycles, which are just dreadful machines, <laughs> really unreliable. I was forever breaking down and pushing them and trying to fix them by the side of the road, which little did I know, but it was actually good training for my <laughs> future trips. But... Um, but so I rode those bikes for, for a sort of year or so just around London, really. And, and I think it was just the idea of like, well, this I had this light bulb moment and I thought, oh, this is this is the way to see the world. This is a great way to meet people. I could see that motorcycles brought you, you into lot of contact with lots of interesting people and, and places. And it was a way to be completely autonomous because I'd never fancied the backpacking thing, sort of being stuck on a bus with a giant rucksack. Or anything. <laughs> I always wanted my own wheels. But a car was too was you're know, too sealed off from the world, uh, and I'm probably too lazy for a bicycle. To be mm. fair, um, short trips only on my bicycle. So it it seemed like the perfect vehicle for seeing the world, meeting people, and 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 I still feel that that it really is a it is a great way to 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 see see the globe. So in 2003, you decided to take your bike and head off to Alaska and you were going to cycle from the top of Alaska all the way down to the southernmost town in the world at the very bottom of Argentina. But how, how did you, what I suppose what I'm interested in is, is how did you even plan or how did, why did you decide on that route and how did you plan it or did you not plan it? <laughs> yeah, good question. It's this fine line between sort of planning but not over planning but preparing uh, not over preparing, but not actually being completely, you know, clueless as well. <laughs> I was quite clueless because I, I really had hardly ridden outside of the M25 when I came up with this idea. So I, I started doing my research, but back in those days, I mean, I know it was only 2003, but there was very little information. There's a great book called The Adventure Motorcycling Handbook, and there was a, a website uh, from people that had done similar trips, but they tended to be sort of older guys on big bikes and. I found a couple of women that had done similar things and got in touch with them um, and they were really helpful. And I basically, all I knew is I wanted to go on a big motorcycle trip around the world, I suppose, with my initial plan. But I realized quite quickly that I probably didn't have the cash for that to go all the way around the world. So I settled on half of the world and I really, I just looked at the globe and I, and I thought, well, that's like a perfect top to bottom route really uh, and you get a huge variety you, you can start off in america so you kind of ease yourself in with an english language country and uh, you know first world country where you can get the stuff you need and and then of course go into latin america and it all gets a bit more spicy down there so um so, so i thought that's a kind of good practical solution and and so that's how i came up with that that route really um and i i don't know it was just a mixture of just kind of uh, a little bit of preparation, getting the right kind of bike. Um, I sold my old bikes and bought, a, a, like I say, a sort of more modern dirt bike. I mean, it's still secondhand, but it was it was small. And this was kind of unconventional in that most people feel like, oh, big bike, you know, big trip needs a big bike. But I'm quite short. I'm a five foot four and I wanted something that I could pick up that was light, that, was, that, that could go anywhere. So it had to have dirt bike capability, off-road capability, and how to be able to touch the ground. <laughs> that was very important to me as well, because I wasn't very experienced, really, riding on certainly not off-road riding. So I've kind of got all these factors together, found a small bike that suited my needs, decided on the route from this kind of um, idea that, you know, that I'd ease myself in gently through America. And, and, and then that was, that was it, really. So that was about as much planning as I had. I had a start point and I had an end point and and that was about <laughs> the size of it, really. I mean, I absolutely love um, independent solo travel and, you know, grabbing my backpack, heading off. And I headed off to South America to, you know, backpack solo around there sort of last year. Mm -hmm. But one of the one of the comments that I get quite a lot of the time or what people say to me is like, oh, you know, oh, aren't you scared? Um, aren't you fearful? You know, anything could happen. <laughs> anything could happen over there. And it's it's almost like the reaction of, you know, friends and family or people basically not wanting you to go away or not wanting to put, you know, to get into danger's way. And there is a lot of fear about sort of traveling, especially being a woman, especially yeah. being a woman in places like, you know, South America, maybe not so, maybe not so much with America, but there is this, this fear. So how did you handle other people's reactions to wanting to undertake a trip like this? And how did you handle your own internal fear? Mm. Yeah, it's a good question because the naysayers are the great, I, I think, the, the great problem for a lot of people. I mean, 
you do get a lot of people saying, oh, you know, all these terrible things that, that, that are going to happen to you. And when you dig a little bit deeper, you find that the people that say things like that tend not to have been to the place you're going or tend not to have travelled. And they tend to be getting their information from, you know, lurid headlines and the like. So I, I sort of learned quite quickly to avoid those people, actually. I mean, really, that's all it comes down to is surround yourself with people who have done what you're doing and you you won't find anyone of them telling you not to go you know it's it really is that straightforward uh so th- that's very important i mean iran is a classic example of that it, it, I, i've been there a couple of times on my bike recently and uh, when i first went oh the the reaction you know this is a few years ago and it was still kind of considered a bit hairy people were were absolutely horrified but they were only the people that hadn't been to Iran. When I found a couple of people that actually had been there, they found they thought it was perfectly a good idea um, and, and were totally supportive. So this is the thing is even if it's your friends and family, I'm afraid you have to kind of just shut them out for a little while. Otherwise, it can really get to you, um, all that kind of doom mongering. <laughs> um, and as for my own fears, I mean, I was, of course I was scared. It's silly to say that you're not. Even now, if I set off on the trip now, I'd still be sort of apprehensive because the whole point is you don't know what's going to happen. But then, of course, that's the beauty of it as well. But you mustn't let the fear spoil your fun. This is the crucial thing. You need to exercise, obviously, common sense so you don't kind of go, I don't know, out on the lash in some (laughs) South American capital city by yourself. But um in staggering home, you know, whatever you might do back, back home, <laughs> you know what I mean? So you do, you know, I tend, I, I did modify my behaviour, I suppose, and obviously, you, you know, same with clothing, and it is annoying in some ways, you know, we'd obviously love to live in a world where we could just freely go around doing what we, we like the whole time, but it, it's, it's finding that balance between sort of modifying your behaviour so you don't get yourself in really difficult situations, but also knowing when it's okay to take that risk and when you meet a stranger and they say, hey, come back to my place or come come to a party. And what happens, I find, is when you're travelling, your instincts become really, really well honed. And after a while, you know, even every trip I take now, I notice within a couple of weeks my instincts are right there, alert the whole time, and I just can tell it, it, within seconds if somebody's, you know, a goodie or a baddie, really. And and I can honestly say that I've never um, got that wrong. No, I, you know, I actually agree with that because you do, when it's just you out there traveling by yourself, the only person that you can rely on is you. Exactly. And you've got to be alert, you've got to pay attention. And unfortunately, you do, like you said, it's about applying common sense. It is modifying your behavior. It's not going on the lash in, um, <laughs> you know, capital, you know, in crazy cities and not yeah. knowing how to get home. It is, it is being, it is being sensible with it. I mean, the route you took is absolutely incredible. It's, it's over 20 odd thousand miles there must have been some incredible high points and some also some very challenging sections what were some of the highlights for you uh the bit that i always remember very fondly is crossing the border from america uh, in so i was in california uh, crossing into mexico and you know anyone that's traveled in america will know that americans are quite fearful you know as a nation they're terrified of their a neighbor south of the border so when i would say oh, i'm going to mexico on my own you know going into south america central america mexico on my own on the bike you know they're full of horror so and i didn't know any better really i'd i'd only ever traveled in the in the western world before so i'd never been to sort of third world country or anything and so i i i just sat out my visa in the states terrified to cross the border i was there on the very last day oh god i gotta go now you know (laughs) expecting to be attacked by these mexican bandits or whatever everyone was telling me was going to happen to me and i crossed the border and and suddenly everything was fine of course you know super lovely friendly place mexico wonderful people great food brilliant and and it was just this sort of dawning of like oh the last two or three months or whatever have just been a bit of a muck about this this is what it's all about this is what I came for and it was that moment of like okay here we go you know and it was just so exciting because suddenly everything was different everything was strange everything was just weird and exciting and and this is the thing that is two sides of the same coin scary and exciting are the same thing really so you have to if you feel scared you a lot of it is just persuading yourself that it's exciting rather than scary <laughs> so as you're traveling along were you were you were you, were you stopping off at like sort of scenic bits of bits on the way down and planning to go and, and sort of off the road or was it just sort of almost like a straight trip and trying to get there as quickly as possible or 
So did you have a time frame? I, well, I had a loose time frame that I'd made up in my head. I didn't have to get back for anything because I'd sort of given up my job permanently. Um, there's a traditional it's kind of a travelers meeting down at the bottom of South America, Ushuaia. Every New Year's and Christmas, you know, there's like a load of travelers get together. So I was sort of loosely aiming to get for that, but I dilly dallied and all sorts of things happened along the way. So I was about two months late. <laughs> so no, I didn't really have an itinerary and I definitely wanted to stop off. I mean, it's good to have a goal like, okay, I'm going to the tip of the continent because it kind of keeps you going, gets you up in the morning and you, you, you know, you, you have this kind of, no, not fixation exactly, but but something to aim for, and I think I I personally need that rather than just sort of gentle gentle ambling the whole time. I probably would never get anywhere otherwise. So that was my overall goal. But I would certainly dilly dally, and I changed my planned route and went into countries that I didn't intend to go into, and met people, and you know went off with them for a bit or whatever. And if I saw a nice beach, I'd hang out there for a while. And yeah, so it was very very loose. And for me, that was really important because. I'd been working all my life, you know, since I left school, I'd been getting up and going to work. And I was really just tired of having to be somewhere all the time. And for, that was a huge appeal to me for just for a short period of time in my life. I mean, just a matter of, you know, 10 months, I was able to do exactly what I wanted when I wanted. And that doesn't really happen very often. It becomes so, very addictive, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, exactly. Well, I've never gone back to the office job. <laughs> yeah. so, so we've talked a little bit crossing over the border in, into Mexico you've been dealing with your fears you've been dealing with other people's other people's fears and you've obviously having sort of an amazing amazing time but there must have been some challenging situations that you that you came across and that you had to deal with are there any experiences that stand out for you yeah I mean the worst thing that happened on that particular journey I mean actually my second trip through Africa was only half the distance and half the time but it was a thousand times more challenging for all sorts of reasons so when I look back now that first trip was actually a bit of a dawdle really compared to the other stuff <laughs> but on that particular trip I met up with a girl for a little while who rode with me and she had a terrible almost fatal accident and that happened in Bolivia on a Sunday and they're very religious and don't really do very much on Sunday so it's quite hard to kind of get anything ha happening and she, and it was I mean she smashed face first into a cliff and, and the cracked her skull and all I mean it was absolutely brutal so that was a really shocking thing to deal with I mean obviously god thank heavens it didn't happen to me but to, to have it somebody have to happen to somebody that you're traveling with and to see that and you're in a very remote part of South America and it's the poorest country in South America so you know things like ambulances and medical care are pretty rough so that was pretty traumatic apart from that I, I didn't really have any uh, major half I got a bit of kind of trouble at borders with police and kind of the border guards roughing me up for bribes and that kind of thing. And that was a bit intimidating going into Honduras. I was kind of held for a few hours and had money extorted from me and things like that. But I mean, to be honest, that's really par for the course on a, on a trip like that. So yeah. I, ha I had one crash myself in Chile on a dirt road, on a gravel road and, and, and was a bit hurt, but nothing broken. So again, I was quite lucky. So it, it was that kind of thing, but really in 20,000 miles, these things are going to happen. So it's, really you did like I say when you're out there you do just kind of get on with it I mean you said it was almost like oh, it would be fantastic to talk a little bit about your later trip to to Africa and Iran and you said this was sort of like an introduction really to the world of the world of traveling it was a bit of a, almost a dawdle or you know sort of <laughs> relatively easy but I think that's almost like how it starts isn't it it's sort of building up your confidence gradually like the further you go the more experiences you have the more situations you learn how to handle you know actually dealing with those border guards and you know being a hustle for money I suppose you know the next time it happens you're sort of a bit more you have more understanding around the situation and how to handle it and think okay well this is what's happening this is how I need to react so what would what do you think you learned the most on that trip about yourself? Yeah, I think you're right. Obviously, you do, you know, these things sound terrifying if you've never done something like that before, but you do uh, build up confidence. And I always say to, and to myself, thank heavens I didn't do the Africa trip first because I think it, it actually might have put me off Yeah, because uh, it was so, so difficult in so many ways. Uh, but having obviously ridden through, you know, the, the Americas, I was kind of ready for the next challenge, which I think Africa is, is kind of the ultimate 
from a motorcycle overland challenge. So I suppose what I learned really is that I, that I think all of us are far more resourceful and resilient than we realise. And our everyday lives don't challenge us that much. And for me, that was actually part of the motivation for the trip is that I felt like, well, this is a good job and I've got a nice life in London with, you know, my boyfriend, my friends and, you know, there's nothing to complain about at all. But I just had this, and I think it's probably quite a human urge to to test yourself, you know, uh, in some way. And I wanted to kind of, it wasn't so much a physical challenge because I'm not like an athlete or anything like that. It was more... Um, like a, I wanted to live on my wits. I wanted to to test myself and see see you know how I would cope really in the big wide world if I just threw myself into it and saw what happened. So I guess in that sense, it it, it gave me a confidence, not necessarily just related to riding motorcycles or traveling. Not so specific. It's more a uh, kind of overall thing that you think you, you think you're more inclined just to have a crack at something. Yeah, um, right. generally, you know, and it could be anything. It could be starting a business, or I don't know, making a difficult phone call, even to you know, so or whatever. And I, and I found that I would, I I, I could draw on uh, experiences that I'd had on the road to help me in other areas of my life. And the other thing I suppose that it taught me most of all is really that everything works out in the end, <laughs> which sounds quite simplistic, but, it, you know, every everything can be fixed. Every disaster can be sorted. I mean, beyond the obvious of actually something really terrible happening to you. One of the questions I get asked the most is, oh, but what happens if you break down in the middle of nowhere? And, of course, that does sound like a really awful thing to happen when you're sitting at home imagining yourself in some desert somewhere. and you break. But... You, you always work it out. Somebody comes along, you find flag somebody down, you or you fix it yourself, or, you know. And these are all great life skills that, that can be applied all over. And this is one of the things that I think for people who worry about taking, say, a year out of their career, actually, you'll come back and be a far more um, kind of positive asset to a to um, to your company or to your boss or whatever, or to yourself even if you you know. Uh, with all these skills that you've kind of learned on the on the road. No, absolutely. I, I was going to say, I was very fortunate. I actually went travelling when I was 18 and headed over to Southeast Asia, Australia, New Zealand. And I think exactly like you said, it gave you that inner confidence to try new things. It gave you so many life skills. And it just made you more willing to, to just get involved and to, mm-hmm. I don't know, just to, just to participate. So just quickly, what was it like sort of getting to the finish like sort of you know you're you're, you're heading down you're, you're 20 you know nine nineteen thousand nine hundred and ninety odd miles in you're coming into the final sort of 10 miles um or a couple of miles what was that like for you well it was great I mean it, it was yeah it was a fantastic feeling to to be at the tip of South America and think well the next stop is Antarctica and then to reflect over everything that had happened in the last 10 months, you know, and to think, wow, you know, 10 months ago, I was si- sitting in a motel in Alaska and my, actually my bike wouldn't even start. <laughs> so it was a very um, humble start to the trip. And, 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 and to, to kind of think back to how you felt then and then how you feel now, that that's quite something really. So it was great. Um, I, and I, I think I, I was looking forward to going home because I'm not sort of one of these people that wants to be on the road endlessly for, you know, 10 years at a time. I'm quite a home body in a way. And I love my my home and my life in London. So I was looking forward to going home. But I sort of and I had no idea what was going to happen. But I just felt that things would be OK, that whatever would come out of this would be OK. And I think that the chip gave me that positive feeling, really, about the future that it would work out. When do, I mean, whenever I sort of finish sort of trips or adventures before, I sort of get like a little bit of a high and then I almost get a little bit of a, right, what's next? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so how did that, what was that like for you? I mean, coming back to the UK, was everyone expecting, right, she's got it out of her system now. She's rode for 20,000 miles. She's headed from Alaska all the way down to the, to the bottom of Argentina. She must be done now. And yet for you, it, it wasn't. What, what sort of happened next? Yeah, because that's what exactly what happened. You're right. It, it, I think there is that thing of, oh, you're getting out of your system. And everyone's like, oh, God, you must never want to sit on a bike again. Your ass <laughs> must be killing you. And I was thinking, well, I can't wait, actually. <laughs> well, what happened next was actually I wrote the book. 
um, which which is something that came about as a, as I said on the road. I ended up sort of getting being uh, in, put in touch with a literary agent, and and that all happened. So I, I was quite stationary for a couple of years with that all going on, um, and then I like I said, Africa is sort of represents the, the the greatest motorcycle challenge really of the of the world, I would say. And because of the crossing the Sahara Desert and uh and so I decided to do to, that I really, really wanted to ride down to Cape Town. Now I got married as well at this point, but luckily I married a um a fellow motorcycle adventurer who was very encouraging about such things. I mean, yeah, I, it, it wasn't like I had a big career plan of like, right, okay, I'm going to start doing this, this for a living. But it just, that's the way it worked out. And I had another, uh, you know, with the second trip, I had the offer of writing my second book. So that all worked out too. Um, and so three years later, I rode down through Africa to Cape Town to across the Sahara and then through the Congo and Angola. And that really was, uh, I mean, actually now when I look back and I think, oh, crikey, I couldn't do that again. <laughs> it really was full on. Uh, I was just going to say, now, did you meet your husband? You said he's a fellow motorcycle adventurer. Did you meet your husband on the road? No, this is the, the, the strange thing. I met him before I left because a friend of mine put me in touch with him because I said, oh, I'm planning this trip and I want to ride my bike to South America and he said oh you should talk to this guy you know he's, he's ridden around the world and he'd made tv shows about it and so I, he put me in touch and so it was sort of love at first sight and then it was like oh no see you in 10 I, months <laughs> yeah, kind of yeah oh no I've got to go now and he was very very um encouraging and said right you've got to go and do this trip um you've got to go on your own because that was the plan and I didn't you know I didn't mean to say I didn't want him to come with me but it's very important for me especially for that first trip that I did it by myself that was kind of a calling for me and he said you know I don't want you turning around to me when we're 80 years old <laughs> and saying oh you wouldn't let me go on that bike trip you know so he was really behind it all so that was great and it obviously was really helpful and so when I came back we got married in, the, in after the first trip and then off I went to Africa <laughs> Oh, congratulations on getting married. That's absolutely awesome. So Africa. Now, Africa, I think sometimes people forget about like the size of the country and, you know, all the different areas that you're going through. You mean, you mentioned the Sahara Desert. I've recently just spent um, Mm -hmm. a week of my life running across it. (laughs) Maybe not across all of it, but, you know, a good, uh, I think it was 250 kilometers of it. So that's definitely such a challenging environment. So uh, did you do more research and more planning? Did you need to get a different bike? Were you aware of um, uh, of what type of equipment that you needed to take with you? Yeah, I got a different bike because my other bike was pretty worn out. Well, no, actually, well, it was really worn out. I sent it home from Argentina and I actually got stolen in London. Oh, <laughs> I know. Um, anyway, gutted. yeah. So I did get a different bike for that, similar style and size and everything, but a bit newer and and all the rest of it. And I I was much better about preparing it and and the kit that I would need. You know, I'd learned so much from that first trip that I think I had it down with all the gear. So that was really helpful. Because the first trip I was a bit, it was a bit shambolic, really, to be honest. Um, but really, there's nothing that can prepare you for Africa. <laughs> it was like wham, and the, just a sheer. It was the most physical, um, physically demanding of any riding that I've done. Because um, it, it's basically all. There's hardly any tarmac on the route that I took, except for a bit at the top and a bit at the bottom. So crossing the Sahara, incredible experience. That's probably the greatest motorcycling experience of my life going through Algeria but then it really got sticky in the Congo and Angola where there are landmines and I got stuck in a minefield and then I got the soldiers sticking guns in my face and stealing my chocolate biscuits and all sorts not your chocolate biscuits (laughs) so it was it was pretty hairy and so I think talking about you know arriving at the end of the trip that you I don't know if you've been to South Africa but you get to the Cape of Good Hope and there's a sign you know this is where the the continent ends kind of and that was a really incredible moment and I, I did feel like that oh god you know if I can do this, I'll pull off anything. It was quite full on. But it's hanging on to that feeling when you get back. That's the thing. Because you, so you slip back into your kind of regular life so quickly. That's the, that's the thing. And it, I think it's more just a, it has a, an effect on you that it's maybe a, just takes uh, time to, I don't, know, I don't know, filter through really. Accommodation wise, are you camping as you're traveling? Are you, is it couch surfing in Africa? Is it hotels? <laughs> is it hostels? Is it just wherever you lay your bike put a bit of tarp over the top and you're good <laughs> yeah how, how does it work sort of like yeah sort of accommodation wise 
Well, it was probably a bit of all of those things. Um, camping, I always carry camping gear with me because then it's like whatever happens, you know that you can go into the bush and, and, and find somewhere. But in Africa, that, in the desert, it's easy because there's no one there and it's just completely empty and amazing to camp in the desert. But in the more kind of jungle area, there's loads of people and, and you can't go anywhere without someone popping up out of a bush, you know. <laughs> um, so... So it was a bit of camping in the desert. I would find sometimes little kind of hotels in the towns and villages. A lot of the time in Africa, there's tons of missionaries and missions, even in the smallest village. And there, there'll be like uh, accommodation that's provided by missionaries for travellers and, and African people as well that are travelling through. So you can often rent a, just a really basic room in places like that and then sometimes you know the people in the remote areas the villagers would kind of take me in so I remember in Angola you can't camp in the bush because there are still loads of landmines everywhere so it's a bit risky to sort of just drive off the road so I'd go into a little village you know literally of little mud huts you know round thatch mud huts and say to the chief you know can I camp here and then he'd be like yeah you know then the whole village would come out and watch me hitting my tent pegs in and you know and then <laughs> so so it would be a bit a bit of that really a bit of you know there's a, there is an awful lot of hospitality I think that any travelers will tell you that is a quite a common phenomenon I was gonna say I mean one of the things I would notice about traveling one of the, the favorite bits or is almost the, the best bit for me is actually the people that I meet along the way because I'd like to you know I've been in some of the most incredible places in the world and I, you're just there with the wrong people. And then other times you are in the most shocking situations. You know, you've run out of money, money, you're trying to cross the border into Thailand, but you can't because the border crossing is closed. So you're basically staying in like a pig shed mm-hmm. and, and you're just, but with the best people. And it is always about the people. You must have met some amazing people from either other travelers or from the local, from the locals. Are there any sort of situations that stand out for you? Oh, I mean, so many. It's, I mean, I could write a hundred books on it, really. For me, I'm interested in people more than anything else, really. So that's my kind of, um, that's the motivation, really, for me, is like getting out there and talking to people and hearing their life stories and all the rest of it. And and I think that's increased as I've gone along. I think that my first trip was all about what what's going to be like for me? What can I do? What, what You know, I want to test myself. And as I've gone on, I've realised that actually the, the real, like you say, the real... Um, I don't know, the appeal of travel is all the, the interesting people you met. And and that really, I think, for me, came, you know, the ultimate place for that was Iran because everybody is so – just the hospitality is out of control. It is unbelievable. You can't walk down the street or stop at a petrol station without someone offering to take you in or feed you, or you know. So I met the most incredible people in Iran. I mean, also in Africa too – and I think the motorcycle actually is really good for this because it it makes you quite easy to approach. And so people tend to come up to you, maybe more so if you're on your own and maybe even more so if you're female because you're often a, a bit of a novelty because often, especially in sort of developing world countries, you don't see women riding motorbikes so much. So they're a bit, people come and sort of peer at you a bit and ask you questions. And of course, that's wonderful because then you've got this opening and and then you're off, you know, and you're being invited back to their house or whatever. So, yeah, I, I mean, there's so many experiences of people also helping me when I, you know, had bike trouble on the road and a guy in Argentina sort of stopped by the side of the road and, and took me back to his brother's workshop and they were all feeding me cakes and tea and fixing my bike and, you know, all of this kind of thing. And so, so I mean, really loads and loads of stories like that. But Iran is the best place for that. Ever. And people are extremely uh, well educated in Iran, very sophisticated, a lot of great, um, very high level of English speaking, and their stories uh, are just fascinating. So, if from if you're a people person, people watching, listening, nosy gossip person like me, <laughs> then <laughs> Iran is the best place to go. I mean, one of the things that, that I am horrendous at is probably map reading sense of direction try, you know <laughs> trying to get from a to b i mean i know obviously in your case you could really simplify it just be like just need to head south that's the only way i need to go <laughs> yeah. and i'll eventually get to the southernmost point of the continent you're, you're you're traveling down but but how was it when you're actually traveling were you um relying on maps were you using like your iphone gps or what were, do you how did you sort of actually what was the practicalities like 
Yeah, I'm. A, I mean, I'm a total luddite, so I'm a real paper map person. I don't. I try not to travel with electronics, really, uh, on the whole. And I mean, in 2003, I don't even know if such things really existed. <laughs> probably, they probably did if you knew about things like that. I'd, anyway, I've never even held a GPS in my hand, so I wouldn't know what to do with it. So all paper maps, and it's fine. In fact, in a, almost it's kind of easy in, in sort of remote parts of the world because you've generally just got one road that links one town to the other, you know, so you're on it and that's it. But the real difficulty came in cities. You know, I remember riding through and trying to get out of Guatemala City, which is one of these kind of absolute insane Latin American seething hell holes. And, and it took me about <laughs> half a day to just to find my way out. It was just awful. So, you know, I'd find like city maps that I would have cut out of a guidebook or something like that. And I'd have them sort of stuck on my hand. But often this is the other thing that any place that is slightly volatile politically will have had some revolution where everybody changes the names of the streets to whoever the latest dictator is. <laughs> so, you, so you've got this map that might be from before when the other dictator was in or whatever, and everyone's name has been changed. And, you know. So it was really, really awful sometimes. And Iran was the one place I just thought, oh, God, I really wish I had a GPS. Because obviously also the language, you know, the, the, the alphabet, is it's all Persian. And, and so once you get off the main road, there's no English on the road signs at all. And then... There's just just had no hope. <laughs> so I got lost a fair bit in Iran in the kind of more rural areas. But what I realised, actually, I used to get a bit distressed about it. And then I thought, actually, if I had a GPS and I was just following this little screen, I'd get where I want to go, but I wouldn't have any of the kind of weird little diversions which often take you to somewhere interesting or I wouldn't ever have this opportunity to stop and say to somebody, you know, and I'll ask for direction. And sometimes those things are what leads into really interesting conversations or interactions or finding little off the beaten track places or just, you know, just kind of fun, interesting moments that, that really is what the whole adventure is meant to be about. So now I'm kind of a bit of a proponent of maps and getting slightly lost sometimes and talking to people. You sometimes have the best adventures when you do get lost. Exactly, lost. yeah. <laughs> so it sounds it sounds absolutely incredible what you're doing. What would be like a typical day? Do you have a typical day? Are you are you sort of stuck? Do you have a routine? So it's up at seven or eight in the morning, or how, yeah. how do you work it? I'm not very good at getting up. <laughs> <laughs> 10 at 10 11 o'clock <laughs> yeah I'm yeah I mean I think I, when I was on my first trip I would at the beginning of my first trip I had real white line fever I would ride and ride and ride it was almost like I just I could I was compulsively riding all day and I didn't want to stop even to eat you know it was just, and that wore off after a few weeks but I think I've heard other people say that those that the beginning of a trip is sort of this compulsion to keep going and now I'm really lazy I mean my last trip around Iran I was probably only doing about 100 miles a day because I was just always getting up late chatting to people stopping for some tea stopping for some lunch and do a few more miles stop in a town have a little wander around you know, so and and I think that that's more my preferred style of traveling now is you know not really kind of going for it, um, but but kind of soaking up the atmosphere a little bit more. But um, it depends. I mean, you know, there are times often where you might be in a very kind of I don't know, just a very featureless part of the landscape where it's you know I remember going three hundred miles in one hit in in Canada because it was just three hundred miles of pine trees, and there was. <laughs> really any point in stopping but then in other places you might be seeing things all the time that you want to stop so it, I guess it varies really. Iran I mean when so you've obviously you know you've, you've traveled down the Americas you've traveled through, Af through traveled through Africa and your next big trip was Iran mm -hmm. and I you know I don't want to sound ignorant but if I think of Iran I'm not sure I'd put it up there as a list of, of somewhere that I'd want to to go and visit and that's mostly down to to the media portrayal and everything else but on your website it you, you talk about out of all of your journeys that that was the one that affected you most profoundly so I'm just wondering why you why you chose Iran in the first place yeah well Iran I was sort of fascinated with it because of the media portrayal of it, because as I'm sure that you'll know too, that you go somewhere and that people tell you it's dangerous, you know, say, say on my first trip, Colombia or El Salvador, people would sort of be like, oh, you know, don't want to go there. And then when you get there, you realise actually it's nothing like uh, the media portrays it or like how, you know, or how people um, envisage it. And it's just full of regular people just trying to go about their business. And then, of course, Africa was the same. I went to, you know, through places like Congo and uh, Angola. 
and so I was becoming, you know, aware from a real point of, uh, from reality that actually all these images we have are, are based on what? Nothing really, you know. And I, I sort of, especially intrigued by Muslim countries because there's this just, I think that there, we, we just have this incredible Islamophobia in our media, which even if you f- think you're an open-minded, worldly kind of person, which I'd like to have thought that I was, you can't help but be affected by it. It's sort of a drip feed. And so I thought, well, from my based on my previous trips, if you're scared of something, it's because you don't know about it, really. And why are you scared? You should go actually go and have a look. So it was sort of, in a way, born out of fear. And addressing that fear and thinking, well, go and find out if there is actually something to be scared of. And then um, an Iranian guy kind of, he, he I, I got I found a note left on my bike. Um, this is sort of what, what sort of got me going outside the Iranian embassy. There'd been a big sort of spat at the Iranian embassy between the British and Iranian uh, governments. And they'd, they'd been expelled and we'd expelled them, they'd expelled us and all this sort of thing. That was in 2011. And this guy sort of wrote me this note. I don't know who he was, but he sort of said, go to Iran, you know. And I thought, how funny, what a weird thing to do. And then when I did go to Iran, it really made sense because they are so uh, uh, keen for people to come to Iran and see actually what the reality of the country is like. As I said, they're incredibly hospitable people. And they're very distressed, I found, a lot of people truly distressed at how they're perceived in the outside world. And they're very aware of that and keen to make make amends. So so it really it was, when I said that, that it was the trip that affected me the most, I think that was it. Why? Because I could see how wrong we got it. So mm-hmm. that was really the motivation, and that's, and that's why it had such a profound effect on me. No, absolutely. I, I think it's amazing because I think um, you, you would be thinking, oh, you know, lone female, Mm. Um, being on a bike is it is it a country you want be you want to be traveling to but it's obviously had a um, huge impact on you so you are writing a book about that experience at the moment mm. are there any are there any particular highlights from the from the book that that'll be coming out that you want to share <laughs> well i mean it, it, again it was this i mean I, I i'll never forget this it's like a tidal wave of kindness and warmth that hit me as soon as i entered iran from Turkey and I was overwhelmed really and this is from men and women so that was a kind of overwhelming experience but there's certain specific I mean there's so many stories of of people helping me out in Iran I mean it wasn't all easy I have to say people some you know dealing with the authorities and the police and the army and that kind of thing was was challenging and had a few sticky moments did they think you were a spy <laughs> yeah that kind of thing yeah. you know I was fingerprinted and roughed up and the revolutionary guard kind of tried to run me over and you know so yeah normal normal <laughs> everyday normal thing. Kind of thing but the, the, the crucial thing is that I realized anyway that the, the government and the people are two entirely separate entities and of course that sounds obvious and and if you think about it in our country that that's the case too so i think why do we mix them up when it comes to iran why do we think that they're all kind of crazy ranting ayatollahs you know they're not at all and most of the iranian people are very very disillusioned with the regime that they live under and they have really really awful difficult lives actually and somehow managed to stay so incredibly positive and and welcoming and um yeah i mean i i really would recommend it to, to everybody so, Lois, you have actually written two books. So the first one is Lois on the Loose, which is the story of how you jacked in your job at the BBC and set off alone to ride 20,000 miles from Alaska to Argentina, which sounds absolutely incredible, especially if, you know, if you're dreaming of escaping from your day job or wanting a life on the road, then you definitely want to give that book a read. And do you want to introduce your second book that you've written? Yeah, sure. That's about my Africa trip. So the trip from London to Cape Town is called Red Tape and White Knuckles. And that one's, a, you know, I mean, it's a bit more, it's pretty, gets a bit hairy down there. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a bit more of the action adventure one, I guess. Oh, fantastic. Now, if people want to find out more about you, where would be the best place on the web for them to go? My website is loisontheloose.com. So that's got it all there. Pictures, stories, films, everything. Oh, fantastic. Now, Lois, if there are women out there who have they've read your books, they've heard you speak and they've been inspired, what would be your advice to them if they do want to go off and go travelling and go and have an adventure? Yeah, sure. Um, I think the most important thing is going back to what we were talking about before is not letting people put you off. And and also, I mean, that means personal, you know, people in your life, maybe, as we we're saying, family and friends, even though it's, 
that they're worried about you, it can actually be quite off-putting. But also, I would really say don't get sucked into the to the news. I, I actually find that it's, it, it can be really damaging to, to kind of read all these negative things because, of, you know, news stories are t- tend to be bad stories and the bad stories make for good headlines, unfortunately. Uh, and we don't hear the news stories about, um, you know, women rides around the world with no problems. <laughs> it doesn't make for a good tale. But actually, there are hundreds of those stories out there. So I'd say immerse yourself in, in the positive stuff and, 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 and the positive people. Absolutely. And when is your third book going to be coming out? In January next year. In January next year. Have you got a title for it yet? It's called Revolutionary Ride. Revolutionary Ride. It sounds absolutely fantastic. (laughs) I cannot wait to read it when the book comes out. Lois, thank you so much for coming on the Tough Girl podcast and sharing your story. It has been absolutely fantastic. What's your Twitter handle if people want to reach out to you and connect with you that way? Oh, yeah, sure. It's at Lois Price. So my, my name fantastic so if you've enjoyed this episode then please do send lois a tweet she'd love to hear from you i'd also love to hear from you as well my twitter handle is at underscore tough underscore girl all in capitals lois thank you so much for coming on the tough girl podcast thank you so much for having me it's been great fun A massive thank you to Lois for coming on the Tough Girl podcast and sharing more of her story. Now, Lois, with her husband, Austin, also hosts the Adventure Travel Film Festival. And if you go and check out the web, the website, adventuretravelfilmfestival.com, you'll be able to find loads more information about it. It's going to be held in August um, during the summer months, and it's going to be fantastic. So, On the website, it says it's not just a celebration of the world's greatest adventure travel films from the 1920s to the present day. It's also a weekend knees up of inspiring speakers and authors, live music and good time outdoor action. So come on down, see the world, get inspired and join the party. The next one is going to be taking place in the UK on the weekend of the 12th to the 14th of August. I will be attending, so it will be absolutely fantastic to see more of you there as well. So don't delay, go and get your ticket now from the Adventure Travel Film Festival.com. Just a shout out as well um, for the Tough Girl Tribe. If you are wanting to connect with and meet other awesome women who have similar interests to you, then you can connect with the other listeners of the Tough Girl podcast. Just go onto Facebook and type in Tough Girl Tribe and you'll be able to you'll be able to join this closed Facebook group. Um, this is the only place I mention it. So anyway, I hope you're all having a fantastic week and I'm really looking forward to speaking to you next Tuesday for another fantastic episode of the Tough Girl podcast. Have a great week and I'll speak to you soon.